my name is Jennifer Brown. I'm director of the CLL Center at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, both in Boston, Massachusetts. My research program is focused primarily on the testing of novel small molecules and antibody treatments for CLL. High-risk CLL has traditionally included those patients who carry chromosomal deletions of the short arm of 17 and the long arm of 11, as well as patients with early relapse after highly effective therapy, like chemoimmunotherapy. And about half of patients have unmutated IGH-V, which is another traditional high-risk group. With these new drugs, we find that really the latter groups, the ones with short remissions to standard therapy, or with 11Q deletion, for example, have a much better prognosis than they used to. They can have quite durable remissions with these new drugs. And so the definition of high-risk CLL has evolved to include primarily the 17P deleted group. And then the other group, which is now high risk, is those who relapse after BCR pathway inhibitors. That group remains one that's relatively hard for us to treat. Progression on BCR pathway inhibitors is a troublesome situation even now because many of these patients tend to have fairly explosive disease if you stop the drug. And so it's important to continue the drug while you're sorting out what to do with the patient next and to minimize the time between therapies. Right now, the best data that we have for the treatment of these patients is based on venetoclax, which is a BCL2-specific inhibitor that was approved by the FDA for relapsed patients with 17P deletion. And that drug has been reported to have a 60% overall response rate in patients previously treated with ibrutinib. Other alternatives that could be considered include the PI3 kinase inhibitors, although there are quite limited data with them specifically in this patient population. And I even sometimes go back to the old high-dose methylprednisolone, which can control the disease that worsens markedly when you stop the ibrutinib. I'm very excited about combining ibrutinib and venetoclax. Abrutinib is particularly effective on nodal disease and pulling cells out of the nodes into the blood and bone marrow, while venetoclax is very effective at clearing blood and bone marrow. They also have in vitro synergy in many lymphoma cell lines and CLL cells. And so the hope would be that they work by different mechanisms, the mechanisms of resistance against them are different, and that if we combine them, we can reduce the outgrowth of resistance which currently is somewhat inevitable if we're using a single agent against a tumor that's growing fairly rapidly or is fairly mutable. Achieving MRD negativity in high-risk CLL has historically been challenging. The combination of abrutinib plus venetoclax together, for example, I think could be very promising in this regard. And we have actually seen some very good MRD negativity data with venetoclax plus rituximab just the anti-CD20 antibody rituximab in less heavily pretreated patients with two prior regimens, the MRD negative rate was about 50%. And so combinations are clearly where we need to head to achieve this level of depth of remission in high-risk patients. The treatment of CLL has definitely entered a new era beyond just chemoimmunotherapy toward these novel targeted agents. I feel that we're still learning how best to use them, that right now we mostly have them used as single agents or in combination with antibodies or chemoimmunotherapy. We don't yet have combinations of the novel agents together. We also need to move into an era where we better risk stratify patients based on the fundamental biology of their disease. For example, there's a subgroup of patients that achieve very prolonged remissions with FCR chemoimmunotherapy. For those patients, that remains a very appropriate and effective therapy whereas we certainly would not want to use that therapy in 17P-deleted patients. And so moving forward, we need this optimized risk stratification.